Okay. Well, if everybody's ready, should we kick this off? Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming to this session. So numerously, even though it's lunchtime, that's hugely appreciated. Um, we don't have an enormous amount of time, and we have three excellent speakers for you today. So I will try to say as little as possible so that they can tell you what they're going to tell you, and then we'll throw over to questions from the audience. Now, our speakers are going to share with you their expertise on how science can engage with and inform policymaking, especially when we're dealing with wicked problems using our imperfect brains. So, I'm going to ask, I'm going to introduce each speaker and then ask him or her to share with you their thoughts before we go over to the discussion. Is that okay for everybody? Good. So first, Professor Pearl Dykstra, welcome. Thank you. You're an empirical sociologist and director of research at the Department of Public Administration and Sociology at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. You're also the deputy chair of the European Commission's group of chief scientific advisors, who have this morning at 12 o'clock published their seventh scientific opinion, Scientific Advice to Policy in a Complex World. Second, we'll hear from Professor Ortwin Wren. Ortwin, welcome. You're the director of the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam and professor for environmental sociology and technology assessment at the University of Stuttgart. You're also the chair of the SAPEA Working Group. SAPEA is the Science Advice to Policy by European Academies Consortium. You were the chair of the working group which published the SAPEA Evidence Review Report making sense of science for policy under conditions of complexity and uncertainty, which informs the scientific opinion of the group of chief scientific advisors. And then finally, last on the row, there's David Mayer, who's a colleague of mine at the European Commission. David leads a team at the European Commission's Joint Research Center at the HQ of the Commission here in Brussels. And he leads the team on knowledge for policy. And he is the coordinating author, coordinating author of the July 2019 yes, uh, report, Understanding Our Political Nature, How to Put Knowledge and Reason at the Heart of Political Decision Making. So I'm going to ask each of our, um, each of our speakers to talk about those reports right now, and then we'll throw over to questions. So Pearl, if I can turn to you first. Can you perhaps share with the audience, um, imagine that on one of your regular visits to the Commission HQ here in Brussels, you go to the Berlaymont building and you go to the lift and in walks the president-elect Ursula von der Leyen, presses the 13th floor. What recommendations will you make to the president-elect about how to do science for policy better uh, under the new commission? That would be um, a very exciting uh, trip to the 13th floor. I would start by giving her compliments. I would compliment her for the fact that one of her vice presidents, Maros Shevchovitz, um, has in his mission letter evidence-based policy. Um, his portfolio is on inter-individual relations and uh, foresight. I would also tell her, I'm not sure how long it takes to get to the 13th, but I would also tell her about the scientific opinion, you mentioned it, that we just published. Um, the title is Scientific Advice for uh, European Policy in a Complex World. And I would invite her um, to come and I would gladly hand it over to her. And I think that would take me to the 13th floor and at that point, she's very interested and she asks you to walk down the corridor with her and tell her more. What will you, what will you tell her? Pearl? You are a wonderful chair because <laughs> I was hoping you would go in that direction. I would tell her, and this is based on the evidence review from Sapea, but also our own experience, that it's crucial to engage in a dialogue throughout the process of from while well, developing the question to be addressed by scientific advice, um, to do that together with the policymakers. Um, 
it's an, it will also be an iterative process um, so that there's a good understanding of what science can offer, but also a good understanding of the policy question. That would be one uh, key message for her. Another message would be um, it's crucial to ensure the quality of the science advice. If the science isn't good, the ensuing policy advice will not be good either. And how can you ensure the quality? One is, um, which is something we do, but not all advisory bodies do, is um, to do very structured synthesis um, evidence reviews. What do we know and what don't we know? I would also suggest to her uh, to refine the procedure um, through which conflicts of interest are assessed. And I would also tell her that she might consider um, to codify good scientific advice in a code of practice for those who provide advice to the commission. And my last point, and this is again drawing upon the evidence review, would be to explicitly communicate uncertainties, uncertainties in the evidence, but also parts in the evidence where there seem to be differing views. And it's the role of the scientific advisor to say, or to try and unravel why the views might differ, what the sources of uncertainty are, how serious they are, and whether even there are, whether there are uncertainties, whether nevertheless a certain policy recommendation can ensue. Those would be the points that I would speak to her with at the top level of the 13th floor. Thank you, Pearl. That, that's extremely clear. So dialogue, quality of the science that underpins the work, uh, having a particular process for dealing with conflicts of interest, a code of practice, and best communication of uncertainties. I mean, I, very clear. And I think that leads very well to you, Ortwin, because in, in your thought-provoking uh, review, you talk about a number of these issues. You talk about informing mm. policy, not evidence-based policy. You talk about biases. You talk about the necessity to acknowledge that neither scientists nor policymakers are completely value-free. Mm. And you talk about dialogue. And I wonder if you can also expand a little bit on the, 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 the ideas that you develop in your evidence review report. Well, thank you very much. And I'll have a little bit more time than in the elevator. So, uh, <laughs> but I would like to pick up on these words. Uh, we made it very clear that what we would like to convey to the policymakers is that evidence is crucial but it is only one part of the information that policymakers need in order to make prudent decisions. Now, it is very important, and I would really echo what just Pearl just said, it's important that whatever evidence science comes up with, we need to have a qualification if that evidence is certain, if it's just probable, if it's possible, or if it's a hypothesis among many others. And we need to be very clear about this because in the end, wrong knowledge kills. We have a lot of evidence that if you have the wrong knowledge, it can have disastrous effects on society, specifically on complex issues. And we just talked about climate change and all the other things that are at, at the heart of many of the debates today. But given that we need the best science available in order to avoid very bad decisions, we also have to be very sensitive about the idea that science is not giving the answer. It's not truth talks to power. It is really evidence is an important increment, an important condition for making prudent decisions, but it's not sufficient. And we do need experiential knowledge that comes from many people who have experience with the issue. And we also need a lot of tested knowledge for people who experience the consequences of various decisions. And when we talk about policies, we're talking about interventions into the system. So policymakers intervene 
And so they would like to know normally first, do we have to intervene if the situation is a problem or not? And that's something science can help to understand the situation. Secondly, they have to generate options if there is a problem of how to deal with the issue with the problem that lies at hand. And again, science can help them to be options, to generate options, but it can't be the only one generating options. That's where experiential knowledge, tacit knowledge, and knowledge by people who are affected are extremely important. Thirdly is, what are the consequences of these options? And that's, you know, always was said to me, technology assessment. It's really much more, I would say, it's intervention assessment. What are the consequences in a complex system, which is not obvious, if we do A in order to deal with the problem at hand? And very often, science can help, specifically interdisciplinary or even transdisciplinary science can help to assess these consequences so that the four-step policymaker can make trade-offs. Because very rarely is there an option that only has positive impacts. You always have you know, positive and negative impacts. And that's a part where I believe science and democratic decision making has to go hand in hand because science can identify these trade-offs, but they cannot resolve them. That's something that the decision makers or the democratic um, processes can help to do that to say what are the priorities, how do we resolve trade-offs. And that is where science should step aside a little bit to make sure that other social groups and other uh, stakeholders come into play and help to resolve so that society in general can be satisfied with the solution in the end. So to make it short, I think what the report also says First, we need evidence-informed science policy making. That means science is important, and it's very crucial, specifically if you think about complex issues. Intuition is very often not a very good guide when we have very complex matters. Secondly, science is not the only input to policy making that is crucially important. We need experiential knowledge. We also need values of people because in the end, at the trade-off section, we also have to have the values to resolve these trade-offs. And thirdly, I think it's very important that we not only involve scientists and stakeholders, but also members of the public, I very often work with randomly selected citizens, as a, a group that will basically experience the consequences of political decisions that they upfront have a possibility to voice their preferences, their values, and also their requests so that it can be taken into account. So dialogue is extremely important and a part of the policy making process. Thank you, Orton. Or, or, can I just say, all three reports are extremely worth reading. You can see the one that's been published today. There it is on the screen. All three also have excellent executive summaries so you can very quickly absorb the key messages just as Ortwin's laid out there. I mean, what I heard that was fascinating, science is of course important, it's not about talking truth to power. What I think we'll probably have some questions on is the possible, probable hypothesis, how we deal with those sorts of uncertainties. And then um, I think a point that Pearl would also be able to come in on later on is how we deal with stakeholder opinions in this process, which is, as you say, important. Um, David, uh, I hope you'll forgive me if I grossly simplify the message from your fascinating report. Um, would it be fair to say that the lesson that you have for policymakers is that it's not enough to be right, let's say, but that they also have to make it feel right? I'll, I'll take that as a way in. I think that's very helpful. If someone could put up the slideshow, I just have a few slides to take you through what we're saying. I think if you press the button, it should take that. Uh, and then the next one. And the yep, end. There, you there are. we go. Super. So <coughs> as we've heard already eloquently, it's very clear that the world of politics and policy making does not move in the same way as the scientific world. So that the model we have of how change happens in the science world clearly does not function uh, smoothly in the world of politics. And we realized that, and we realized we needed to understand how does policy change come about? How does, how does policy impact uh, occur? And what we did was we called together a bunch of scientists, naturals and social scientists and philosophers, 
to, te to tell us how humans behave politically. Because if we understand better how we take decisions politically, whether politicians, civil servants, or, or voters, then we could see better how to fit science into this process. And our wonderful experts came up with some fantastic review of the neuroscience, the psychology, uh, and on the basis of that, we have seven messages that I will run through and which pick up very much of what Altwin's come up with. Misperception and disinformation. Our thinking skills are challenged by today's information environment and make us vulnerable to disinformation. We need to think more about how we think. So in other words, we need to start being comfortable saying, oh, that's just your bias talking there, Altwin, or that's my blind spot. Collective intelligence. Science can help us redesign the way policymakers work together to take better decisions and prevent policy mistakes. We can design how we work together in the policy process and the science process so we have genuine collective intelligence. Emotions, and this speaks to the feeling point. We cannot separate emotion from reason and therefore better information about citizens' emotions and greater emotional literacy could improve policy making. Values and identity, we've heard something about this before. Values and identities drive political behavior but are not properly understood uh, or debated. And they not only drive our, our behavior politically, they also drive how we see the facts. They shape our world. Framing, metaphor, and narrative. Uh, and this one speaks very directly to the worlds of science. scientists. Facts don't speak for themselves. Framing metaphors and narratives need to be used responsibly if evidence is to be heard and understood. Trust and openness. This is a picture from the uh, Citizens' uh, Assembly. Or it's, it's the end of the referendum result, actually, in Ireland, but it was preceded by Citizens' Assemblies. The erosion of trust in experts and in government can only be addressed by greater honesty and public deliberation about interests and values. And that includes scientists being more honest about their values uh, and sp spending more time to understand the values of citizens whose, whose lives they hope to have some impact on. And lastly, the importance of evidence-informed uh, policy making. Uh, and this was a bit of a surprise to us. We thought this question of how to better do evidence-informed policy making was a bit of a niche technical interest. But actually what we discovered is that the principle that policy should be informed by evidence is under serious attack. Politicians, scientists, and civil society need to defend this cornerstone of liberal democracy. So this discussion we're having here is not a peripheral part of the political crisis we're in. It is the same crisis and at the heart of it. We are in an epistemic crisis and a democratic crisis. It's the same crisis. So what we're doing here is not a small peripheral thing among scientists. It goes to the heart of how we want to be governed. I think I'll stop there and maybe unpack it a bit more in questions. And perhaps the message to sum it up is we need to bring all our human nature to the job of bringing science to policy. Uh, we need to understand we are not brains on sticks. We are minds inside physical bodies, inside societies, and in a physical environment, and recognize that in how we do science for policy. And one last correction. I'm not the coordinating author for the report. Actually, it's my colleague, Laura Smiley, who did the real work. And uh, Laura will also be around after the session and on our stand if you want to pursue the discussion. Thank you, David. I'm so sorry, Laura. If everybody can see where Laura is, she'll be available to be uh, to talk to you later on. I do apologize. David, I mean, I, I guess you won't mind me outing you as a fellow Brit, but it's a, it's a shame that some of those messages weren't available three uh, years ago. To go back to your immediate previous slide, the um, this is almost word for word what, the, what Commissioner Mwedash, so the commissioner responsible for research, science and innovation at the commission, has included in his quote, welcoming your report, Pearl. Uh, he uses the words that um, evidence is, uh, uh, the principle that evidence should be informed, uh, that science, the policy should be informed by evidence is under serious attack, more or less. So it's, it's very interesting how those chime. I will speak up a little bit. Um, ladies and gents, these were 
fascinating presentations. I'm sure there's lots of food for thought in the questions. I was approached by Sid Kluting before the meeting, and I invited him to uh, say just a couple of words, because Sears, you're um, the chair of the SAPEA board, which is also responsible for producing the evidence review reports that support the group of chief scientific advisors' scientific opinions, and you're also the president of Acad Academia Europea, and I think that your question is very appropriate to quick off the discussion. It should be on, the light is on. Thank you. First of all, big thank you to the, uh, to the panel, because I think you uh, uh, emphasized the, the, the key issues uh, at stake. And of course, a big thank you also on behalf of SAPEA to Ordwin Duran for chairing the uh, SAPEA working group, preparing the evidence review. For SAPEA, it has been a great pleasure to work closely on this uh, topic with the group of chief scientific advisors and the SEM unit. And of course, seeing all these beautiful reports and, and also uh, uh, listening uh, to, to all of you emphasizing that this is really an issue of core importance for the uh, society and actually also, of course, being at the core of the uh, scientific advice mechanism uh, itself. How can we take it further? What is the next step you have in mind? And uh, because this is a very important step, uh, but the issue will not disappear from the table. Uh, it's just the other way around. It will only become more important. So question to all of you in the panel. How can we take it further? Thank you, Sid. Who would like to take this first? Pearl? Let me pass you the microphone. Thank you. Thanks to Siert Kluting for his, how do we take this further? Um, if I may, I'm also going to go back. Um, we as chief science advisors have been around now, the group of seven, working with this wonderful unit in Brussels and being able to rely on the wonderful hundred academies, we're talking about academies of science that are represented by SAPEA. So we're talking engineers and people from humanities and social sciences and the life sciences and the natural sciences. So how are we going to go from here? We will continue our collaboration, but I also want to emphasize how far we have come, the fact that we're working together. Um, the fact that in the previous commission and Commissioner Maidus will still be around till the November 1st, that he has given this opportunity. And at the moment, we're preparing our report on the last four years. And it turns out that we are effective. And why are we effective? Precisely because we have been engaged in a very close dialogue with members of the commission or the commission services. What is your question? How can science help address your question? And that's something that we will very much like to continue. What we also do, um, and that is more, I didn't describe it now, but that's more the role of what happens by the unit, is what we call the policy landscaping. It's crucial for science advisors to know what the needs of the policy makers are. And then I'm talking about needs like what is on the long-term policy agenda. So believe me, we are very carefully studying Ursula von der Leyen's mission letters to see what her plans are, where she is going, to, so that we can be more effective, so that we can use her mission letter as a hook or as a hanger for how we position our advice. It also will inform us about the topics to pursue. They will be Green Deal. They will be the digital society. They will be a lot on social inequality. Inequality in Europe, East and West, North and South. Inequality by age. And yes, inequality by gender. So how will we go forward? We will use these opportunities to continue I think the good work that we've been enabled to do. And we also, what we've also noticed is that the model that we have developed where there's um, a very thorough evidence review and then another group, and that's us advisors, who then take that evidence and bridge that into making policies. And I think one thing that we might do better 
is to better explicate how we go from the evidence to making the recommendation so that it's even more transparent. So those are the routes we want to follow in the near future. Super, very clear, Phil. So then in a sense that you, you talked a little bit there about that two eyes principle, these different stages in the process. Yes. Super. Um, David, I, I know that you've got something coming soon under enlightenment. Is this, uh, is the, are these the next steps? Yeah, I won't try and summarize all the actions that are in the report. There's quite a few. Uh, tangibly, one, two things that we're doing. One is to understand this question of values because it's so important. Uh, and when you talk to the leading scholars of values, they say the field is a complete mess. So we're going, we've just started a project to try and bring some organization to that so we can equip policymakers and scientists to uh, handle values issues uh, and think through them uh, in the politics of their decisions and in the science advice that they're giving. So that's, that clearly there is a very great absence there. We don't know really enough in politics how to talk about values not at cross purposes and to understand how values shake out in political issues. So that's one practical project that we're doing. More generally, we in the JLC have a vocation to help build capacity in the member states to deliver science advice to policy. So uh, we're very conscious that the situation across the EU is very patchy. Some very strong member states with a great ecosystem of science advice bodies and, and something very different in other member states. So it's our vocation to support the development of that uh, infrastructure and ecosystem, working with our good friends in INGSA, the International Government Science Advice Network. So we are very interested to hear in people who want, from people who want to get things off the ground at home. What should the people in this room do? I, I think there are a couple of things. F firstly, if you can leave this room with the reflex that the world of politics is completely different to the world of science. And what works in the world of science to bring about change in understanding will not automatically apply in the world of policy. These other considerations will come into effect. I, I see a lot of scientists still bashing their head against the wall, doing what they normally do, and it works in the science world, and they don't understand why it doesn't work in the policy world. So I think we've explained why it doesn't work. So. Stop banging your head against a brick wall and realize uh, that it's different. And the second comes back to this final point. I think many of the scientists I talk to think that the fact that policy should be based on evidence is kind of an axiom of nature, it's sort of, and it's taken for granted. Wake up and smell the coffee. There are people, there are politicians on this planet. First they go for the independent journalists then they go for the independent NGOs, and then they're coming for independent science. They're coming for you. So this is not something to be taken for granted. It is a value, and I think it's a value which underpins liberal democracy. And like every value, it can't be argued from a scientific point of view. It has to be argued from a values point of view. So if everyone leaves this realizing we're in a bit of a fight, and you're in a bit of a fight, and you have to fight for this, because that's how you defend values. The, the, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. When will we see the values work, and can anybody in the room become involved? Um, uh, the, the values project has just kicked off. We had a public call. We had 250 wonderful values scholars have uh, applied. We've selected a small group. So that process is now closed, but we will find some way for people to keep in touch uh, at a distance in the values project. Uh, and if people spontaneously want to uh, tell us what they're working on, that would be great. Tremendous. Ortwin, would you like to reflect on this? Or? Yeah. Um, I would like to give two short comments. So one thing I would like to pick up Pearl's uh, um, the division of labor between Sapir and Sam, the one gives the evidence report and the other one does the recommendations. I think it's very good to make that distinction, but I think in the future that should be much more aligned. Um, as you pointed out, I mean, it's not that there is out there value-free evidence that you can just collect and then the recommendations come up and then the values pop in. I think there is much more connection between the two and specifically with this report, it was very difficult to make that distinction. And um, and I feel that maybe, you know, if you start to design a new process in the 
you know, how superior in the evidence and SAM in the accommodation can work together, that there should be almost like a joint uh, interface between the two to make sure that what is in the evidence and that is very often ambiguous. At some time it casts, it leads itself to different interpretations and I think it's worthwhile picking those interpretations up and then ask yourself what do they mean in terms of recommendation and how much can we really base on evidence and how much is based maybe on um, you know on specific values that we share and I think that's something I think we need to you know the two groups need actually to uh, to have more negotiation or more conversation about it the second point that I would like to make is that um, you know I'm just like Pearl representing a little bit of social sciences here um, we th when we think about evidence informed, we always think about evidence about the physical world. So you know we know a lot about the physics of climate change. We know a lot about the chemistry of uh, um, plastic in the oceans or whatever. You know all the issues that are out there in the exhibition. But I think there's another contribution of science which I call catalytic approach. And the catalytic approach is that in a democracy specifically, we have hundreds of processes in the vertical and horizontal governance, a lot of levels that have to interact. And I think what we do need and much better need is more research about the process and how to make sure that what we just have been propagating, having scientists, stakeholders, citizens, collaborate in a way that the best of their knowledge is being used to create a good, wisely balanced decision is not easy to perform and not easy to implement. And I think we also need more better research on, or on the design of these processes. Uh, we have a lot about how the processes do not work I mean, in the policy field. You know, the policy scientists always say, well, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, and for what kind of reason? I think what we definitely need in the policy arena is to think about how would we design a process that does take into account the various evidences, that does take into account a plurality of values, and does take account the need for transparency, because otherwise we have the erosion of trust, that you said, when we are dealing with that every day. So we need better processes to do that. And I think that's also a scientific mandate. It's something what we can experimentally do partially. We can do it theoretically. We can do it uh, on a basis of case studies and so on. But we need to do this. And one of the things I think is a major challenge for society today, and that's a challenge on one hand is the fake news. I design my own truth, and then everything fits into the same picture. And that's a very simple picture that is very well to sell to everyone. And the other one is the opposite. Everything's so complicated that we can't move. <laughs> and you know, and now we lose time. And like you know, now in the climate debate, we're losing time because we have to, you know, to take that stakeholder account and that stakeholder, this interest and that interest. In the end, you know, we come up with something that nobody really liked. And I think designing good processes that help to take variety and diversity as a strength, not as a weakness, but still being effective, efficient, and fair. That is a challenge, and I think that's where social scientists are really asked now to provide better solutions. Thank you, Orwin. <clears throat> You've all been incredibly patient. Uh, I think it's the moment for you to inform us. We've talked a lot about dialogue, so let's get that kicked off. Um, I should have said at the start of the session, you've probably been in other sessions where we've used Slido, the app. That's not what we're doing here. We're going to do it the analog way with these things on your body. So if you raise your hand, I'll either bring you a microphone or uh, I think we have this. I'll, 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 will you do it, Agnieszka? That's very kind. Please, the gentleman. Sorry, Pearl. The gentleman here? Yeah. Yes. Great hair. Very good. Please. Agnieszka, the gentleman here in the row standing up. There we are. That's the best way. Oh, <laughs> good one. No, it's fine. This, it's fine. this also this. works as a microphone. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for a very interesting discussion. Uh, this is a subject which uh, I've been working for the last 15 years. I'm at the interface of policymakers in the EU and the researchers. And there are quite a few challenges I, I find in particular when we are looking at very complex problems. Uh, in this direction, we also conceived a newsletter called Science for Environmental Policy, which the Commission diffuses since last ten, ten, more than 10 years. I, I'll give you just three examples. One was the health impact of electromagnetic waves. Commission asked us what we should do. 
in terms of policy. But if you look at the scientific world, it's divided half-half. And when we bring those kind of discussions to the policymakers, they say, I don't want those discussions. Give me one answer. And that's, the, I think, that the biggest challenge we face. Same is when we were looking at banning cadmium, let's say. If you do life cycle assessment, it says, OK, looking at the environmental parameter, whether it's climate change, toxicity, it can be good or bad compared to lithium ion. So there are always, there is no black and white answer when you're looking at a scientific research. But policymakers, they want everything in black and white. And I think that's where we face the biggest challenge. Another example is the impact of medicines on the environment. So the medicines have a very positive health uh, benefit for human beings. But when we're looking at the environmental impact, there are. But then again, you have to nuance. Uh, if you look at the research going on, you have to really nuance. And then the, again, the policymaker says, I don't want the scientific debate in my policy document. I want what I should do. Can I, su can I, summarize, can I try to summarize yes, your question? Please do, please so do say I, I, I gather that what you're saying is that uh, if we go to decision makers with a big, thick report that says, well, on the one hand this, but on the other that, then they're going to be dissatisfied. And your question is, how do we deal with that? Is that, is that a fair summary? Yeah, I, I think that there's also the problem with the language, because quite often the, the language of policy making and the language of scientific research is miles apart. Yeah. And that's where the people like us, they come in between to try to make them understand each other. And which is your organization? It's called Bio Innovation Service. Very yeah. good. Okay. Yeah. But uh, I think that's the biggest challenge when we try to bridge this science policy gap, I would say. So how do we bridge that gap in terms of language and in terms of communicating those not black and white issues? Please do, Pearl. Yes. Thanks thank you for the question. very much for your question. Um, as scientists, we cannot expect policymakers um, to solve our debates. That's a, the role of a science advisor is, and that's the title of the SAPEA report, to make sense of science. So yes, there are differing views. Um, it is our role to say why there are differing views and why nevertheless there is a particular path that is suggested to be pursued and what the certainty is that that path will lead to. And then you get into all kinds of difficult issues like the precautionary principle and then very different kinds of evidence are required than if the evidence is more solid. I want to give you one example from practice that we had and that's the issue of micro and nanoplastics. Um, you just have to look at the television and you see that citizens are very concerned about plastics. And the media contribute to this. We all know the images of, of poor little turtles wrapped up in, in nets, et cetera, et cetera. We also know how eager citizens are to go out into the beach and to pick up plastic. That's big plastic. OK, Europe has this big plastic strategy. Along come micro and nanoplastics. And so the commission asks us, well, what should we do about micro and nanoplastics? We went to the scientists, and the scientists said, because the idea was how harmful is it for people, health, and for the environment. And they're saying, well, there's not that much evidence. Yeah, sure, it's building up in the soil. But right now, yeah, there are some buildups in certain parts of the world, but then there's a lot of other chemical junk there. So there are other problems there. Um, Yes, there's evidence of micro and nanoplastics in some crustaceans, but you have to eat a whole bunch of them before there's harm. We had great difficulty convincing the policymakers to tone down, to not want to jump into action, because they wanted to respond to citizen requests. Because they don't see the difference, or many don't see the difference between big plastics and macro and nanoplastics. So this was a very interesting exercise for us where we could not go beyond the evidence because the evidence, part of it just isn't there because it hasn't been researched, but part of it is there is very little evidence of harm. And to sell that 
message to a policymaker required a lot of dialogue, a lot of very careful language, a lot of very good slides showing what the effects are. Um, but yes, this is something we experienced in practice. But I still think it's our responsibility as people from science who are working with policymakers to not put our problems, and you know how good we scientists are about saying, you know, they've done that, but I can do it better, or we need more money. Never ask for money, because that's one way to really <laughs> frighten a policymaker. Thank you, Paul. Gen gentlemen, I want to give as many people the opportunity to ask questions as I can. So if I can kindly ask you to confine this to your top tip for communicating that kind of uncertainty to policymakers, what's the one thing that you would advise people to do? Um, yeah, I would say two things, unfortunately, because they have come together. First one is, I think that many of us, including policymakers, have not understood that most of our new knowledge about dose and effect are stochastic. And that makes it very difficult because we have distributions, statistical distributions, and if you say, is it carcinogenic or not, and you say yes, people say no, regardless whether it's one times 10 to the minus eight, nine, 10, or whatever. And this is something I think we need to have a better understanding that the, the deterministic world is not one that helps us in the policy field, but the policymakers are still being educated that the world is deterministic. And the second point is benchmarking. And I think that really uh, relates to what uh, Pearl just said. Um, is it dangerous or not is an issue of benchmarking. So if two times 10 to the minus six, is that bad or is that good? And, and then it comes the value at play. Is it good or bad? And I think we have to be much more open about how that benchmarking, you know, you know again, with the plastic. And, and I, I've done, you know, experience with benchmarking is that you have to be very explicit about it. What is the benchmark here? Is it the legal standard that one thing, or is it something like the precautionary principle? There are different benchmarks out there, and that's a comparison that you have to use for judging if something is acceptable or not. I'm tempted to say provocatively, don't worry about it. And why do I say that? Because. I think by definition, almost every single political decision is taken on the basis of some degree of uncertainty. <coughs> there is no certainty in the world of politics. Our economies, our societies, all these decisions are so complex. So in fact, politicians and policymakers are kind of comfortable with uncertainty. They know how to deal with it. That's, that's part of their job. So my advice would be, you know, state it clearly if there's a disagreement and state it simply. And then it's that's normal business for policymakers to deal with uncertainty. Thank you both. We have a question in the centre here. Would you kindly... Pa oh, you have it already. Oh, yeah. Tremendous. <laughs> Please. Hello. My name is Bata Zwierzyńska and I represent a European Council of uh, Doctoral Candidates and Junior Researchers, but uh, I have a strong background in the uh, participatory science, let's call it, call it like that, or activism. Let's say it straightforwardly. Uh, my question is connected to uh, defending cornerstones of liberal democracy uh, if scientists uh, want to stay silent in the name of neutrality. So how do you respond to this uh, academic neutrality uh, and uh, whether shouldn't we be talking more about academic uh, um, autonomy? And my question is strongly embedded also in the uh, in, in my Polish nationality and uh, environment, political environment as well. Thank you so much for the question. You're comfortable with the terms of neutrality and you... you... Uh, but I can answer the question. Please, go ahead. Oh, I, I can <clears throat> give an answer to the question. Uh, so in the work we did, we got a lot of philosophers of science to come in and, uh, and, and talk about this. And one thing I would say is every scientist should read some philosophy of science because I think once you read that, you realize there is no such thing as a neutral scientist or neutral science. There is no view from nowhere. By definition, we present a view from a particular position uh, and we have prior assumptions and values in all our work. And there's, there's no getting away from that. And once you take that view, it's tremendously liberating, actually. Stop trying to beat yourself up about 
trying to assume the white coat neutrality. It's just not possible. No one can do it. The best we can hope for is this, pardon the social scientist in the room, but this dreadful word, intra-subjectivity. But, you know, that you have a variety and a diversity of different subject opinions that covers what people feel. And then that, that's, that's good enough. Is it, is it a dreadful word? No, I, 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 <laughs> I don't know which word you're referring to right now, but I'm, I'm trying to um, grasp what you said about every scientist also has values. Yes, um, we need to acknowledge that. Um, but the point I want to emphasize is that there is something called a scientific method, regardless of the discipline. And that is in training in thinking logically, in explicating assumptions, in being transparent, in trying to make one's work replicable. And those values, which are crucial to science, we need to train our students, we need to train citizens to engage in them, um, to, to be reflective, to be reflexive, um, and to think, and I won't say like a scientist, but still to, to, to use a methodological way of expressing oneself and of thinking oneself. And that's a skill that sometimes is not present in every layer of the population. And I think we, that's where teaching really comes in. The word intersubjectivity really means that everybody would agree on the same statement if that person has the ability to make that statement and is willing not to lie. That is more than we can think of in terms of agreement. And I think I would really stress out that sometimes I think we go too far in relativism of knowledge. I mean, there is knowledge out there where everyone with a very different value system will still agree that the causal connection is there. And that causal connection is not there because we have an objective sense of truth, and I think all the philosophers tell us that, but that everybody who is able to make the same observation and is not lying would come to the same conclusion. And that is a powerful tool. Let me say that that's a very powerful tool, it's, and we need it. You know, in a sense of fake news, if everybody believes what I desire is true, is true. We get in a whole mess of things, and we see that in politics. So we need a kind of institution that says we can agree on something that is clearly not true. And we can agree on something where we say that's clearly true in any way that we can come together. And there are some things, and there are more things that we can see now, where we have a range of answers that all seem to be circulating about what the causal connection is, but we can't pin down into it. And I think that's very important that we be very honest about it, because that's the issue of trust again. If you don't, are, if you're not honest about that, overselling the robustness of science, we have a real problem. But giving up on the issue that there is intersubjective recognition of what, how things work would be, I think, the, uh, would damage, no, no, it would collapse the whole legitimacy of science. Would you like to respond based on what you've heard? <clears throat> well, I cannot say more. Like, I completely understand that. that ju it is just, uh, I wanted it to sound uh, loud and, uh, perhaps to colleagues and, uh, you know, just, just to have it emphasized. So that, that was the, that were the responses that I was actually expecting. So nothing to add. <laughs> Thank you for the question. I'm looking, yes, the gentleman in the front row here with the glasses. Second row. Yes, hello, Ludovic Tilly. I'm the chair of the Coimbra Group of Universities. And I would like to know, with the, the development of open science and citizen science, do you foresee uh, changes in the exercise of scientific advisors? I mean, practically, how the, this job is going to change? I didn't quite catch the bit then. Do you see a change in the practice of? Of the scientific advisors. Oh, the advisors, right. Oh. With open you're, science, you're and asking science. this question, and I assume because you think something might change, so maybe you can elaborate on your question. 
What do you know? That we don't. <laughs> that we don't know. I don't pretend. I don't pretend. No, I, I think that, um, as a scientist as well, a physicist, uh, we we probably believe, and I would probably believe, and I, I, I'm afraid I'm wrong, that uh, science can only be made indeed by experts, by scientists, right? But we know that actually this is not true, and that, in, even if this was right, this is going to change with science, uh, citizen science. So. Basically, the whole community is going to participate to that effort. So how do you see this changing in the way then the scientific advisors are going to build their approach to, 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 I don't know, to, to give the right uh, advices to the policymakers who are going to hear as well what the society is saying at the same time? So there is a sort of uh, increase of the noise, if I may say. I understand your question better. Um, I still think it's a leap to go from open science to changing the practice of science advice. What we do see, um, I, I mean, I'm all for open science. I think it's excellent. It's a, it's a difficult concept because there's the open publications, but there's also an idea of being open at the whole process of science is open. How do I develop my questions? How do I go about answering my questions? How do I go about publishing or talking about my answers? That's another way to look at open science. And then we have the data. Um, how can we share um, our data? And then if we get into the social sciences and health sciences, then there's a lot of privacy issues. So we'll we haven't solved all of these issues yet. One thing we have to watch is how also science can be abused, and that's maybe coming back to the very first question. What we find is that certain interest groups, when we're working on a topic, and then now I'm talking we as the chief seven, they will send us papers, have you seen this? And we will see that it comes from a very specific circle. I'm trying to be very neutral. And we know that this is not good science. We also know that certain people um, will refer to articles because they will take the autism, autism from vaccinations. The paper upon which this belief is based was retracted by science 15 years ago. It still resurfaces. So we have to, and I'm going to come back to my previous point about educating people, um, where we know there's, I'm sorry to say, garbage science too. Um, and this is our role as scientists, that we should sometimes be more strict and say, that should never have been published. So yes, open science provides more opportunities for people to learn about science. But we know the backside of that, and that is that people will always find a scientific paper to back up their political views and can be very vociferous about it. But I understood David wanted to jump in. It's a great question. And I think it depends on whether you think, do we want simply better science advice? but it's then ignored? Or do we want actually advice to change the policy? If you just want good science advice that has no impact, then nothing needs to change. If you want to have some impact, then everything needs to change. And why does it need to change is because, wake up, we are in the middle of an epistemic crisis. I don't know what it is. It's something in the politics. It's something in social media, whatever. You know, the days when August people in white coats and Nobel Prizes could get up and the room falls silent and everyone takes it on trust. Those have gone. Now, the interesting thing is we looked at what is the science of trust and the science of trust, and we wrote it up in the report, trust is, is, if, rests on three pillars. Only one of those pillars is scientific excellence or competence. Only one. So mere excellence or competence on Nobel Prizes is not enough. There are two other pillars. The second one is honesty. So are, uh, are the people giving the, the source of the knowledge, are they honest? Are they perceived to be honest? So there's some work for scientists do on how they persu persuade citizens that they are honest. 
perhaps be more open about the values they espouse, how they're funded, all those sorts of things. Uh, and the third thing is there has to be a community of interest between the people who are being asked to take the advice of the science and the people giving it. So it's very, very difficult if the scientists don't look like the citizens and don't sound like the citizens. Because part of the crisis we have, I think, at the moment is there's a bit of a war between the elites and the citizens. And frankly speaking, this, it looks very clear which side the scientists are on. They look very, very elite -y. They don't look like they're on the side of the people. And that is going to stop the message getting through. So until there is more clearly a commonality of interests and uh, identity between the scientists and the people whose advice you want to take on trust, we will struggle. Great. I'm sorry to be that guy, but we have <clears throat> five minutes, and I know there's a gentleman waiting here. Orton, if you would like to, you can very... No, no, just, oh, yeah. That's very kind. Sir, please. Do you have a microphone or not? Who has the spongy microphone? Good throw. Well done. Yeah, that's me knocked out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, my name's Graham Kai. I'm the vice president of ALEA, which is the European Federation of Academies of Science and Humanities. I thank you very much indeed for your presentations. Greatly valued. Can I take up David's point? Um, I think it's point five. I did write all seven of them down, actually. Um, point five was about um, framing the narrative and um, especially conveying evidence. And it would be marvelous if we had examples, Perel's ex example of a sort of David Attenborough picture of a turtle caught in a plastic bag um, speaks millions <laughs> of words. Um, I just wondered if you had any help and advice on how indeed we could convey the evidence better than we are at the moment. Great question. Walter, can you take it first, please? Yeah. Okay, now I'll take uh, the first chair yeah, because maybe I'll not, never get it again. Um, I think one of the interesting issues about how to convey science is that we are dealing very often now with, with set complex problems where the normal way of learning by trial and error is not the best way to do it. And very often, if you take economics or anything else, you know, the economic system is based on trial and error. You get bankrupt, then you have to do something else. But with a lot of you know, deeply uh, complex issues, the feedback is rather positive. Think about, let's say, the financial crisis, so on. You earn a lot of money, and if you get the tipping point, then everything is over. And that is the most difficult thing to convey because people say nothing happens. And we had that in the climate change discussion for a long period of time. Now, since we had two summers, which were very hot, now people say, OK, now we see it. But before that, they didn't see it. And I think that is where narratives are much more important than maybe in other areas, because the narrative gives you a, a sensible structure of why you don't experience negative impacts, even though what you're doing will have a negative impact in the long run. And there's simulation, gaming, all kind of things you can do there in order to make people aware that if they continue doing X, Y, and Z, if they reach the tipping point, it may be too late because then there's no time to learn anymore. And this is, I think, the main point for me to think about narratives and the conveyance of science because it very clearly says that the intuitive way of learning, of saying, I do something, I get positive feedback, I'll do it again, or negative feedback, I'll change, is not good if we face complex problems. And that's where narratives are extremely important, where simulation is extremely important. And the simulation has to be in a way that people can really you know, identify with the story. Then they feel, oh, I need to change before it's too late. And that's against our nature. I mean, that's something that's not plausible in terms of psychology. And that's where I think narratives are even more important than they ever had been before because we're facing so many complex problems with tipping points. Super. I think we've got about 30 seconds each for the last one. Who would like to... Oh, Pearl. Please do, Pearl. Yes, you've got now a minute. I, I love your question. Um, and for me, it's a question about communication. And we, as scientists, and I'm speaking as a scientist because I am one, have to look very seriously at ourselves and how we communicate our findings. And yes, I know there are all kinds of incentives and pressures from universities to blow up our findings. There's also an incentive to sort of shove away other science and say, 
oh, but there's a gap and I have to fill it. We should stop doing that. I think we have to spend more time thinking of narratives or thinking of images. I'm trying to think of, I'm forgetting his name, but he worked for the World Bank and it was changes in inequality over time and he drew an elephant. Mm -hmm. And the tail, that was the increase in inequality in China. And it was Europe, that was the belly, and there weren't that many changes. And then there was the elephant trunk. nose, trunk. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I can't say we can all do it, but I think let's tr strive to do it. Uh, try it with our children, with our siblings, with our partners, our grandchildren, to try and get a good narrative ac across without Dumbing down, because um, that's the challenge. Simplify, but don't dumb down. But thanks for your question. Thank you, Bill. Um, <clears throat> I think that we have to wrap up, unfortunately. I'd like to tell you all that um, this is a paperless event, but if you would like to receive, I mean, I'm sure you can all use the relevant search engines to find the documents, but if you would like us to send them to you, feel free. I think there's a piece of paper at the back of the room where you can leave your email address and we'll send you all the reports that we've talked about today. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming here so numerously and for your active participation in the session. And I hope you'll join me in giving a round of applause to our three speakers who have been really excellent today. Thank you so much, David, Ortwin and Pearl. Thank you. Thank you. Very good.